stand and sing salvation belongs. All right, well, tonight we're coming to part seven of our studies in the book of Jonah, and we're looking at the title, Man Overboard, and we're concentrating our thoughts on verses 12 to 16 of chapter 1. And maybe you're thinking, now we've got to the seventh message. It's about time Jonah hit the sea. But that's what we're coming to tonight. But we will read chapter 1, um, just to remind us of the context. It doesn't do us any harm at all. Chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him, and said to him, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose trouble this cause, this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he'd fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Father, bless your word to our hearts. Pray, Lord, at the end of this busy day, you'll give us the listening ability and that, Lord, we shall be open to the voice of God to speak into all our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, we looked at the fact that the word of the Lord came to Jonah. In the verse 2, he was commanded to go to Nineveh. In the verse 3, we read, we read that he rose up to flee 
in verse 4, we find that the Lord sent out a great wind. In verse 5, we discovered the mariners were afraid. And while the mariners needed the gospel, God's man had gone down and down and down and was fast asleep. We then read of his rude awakening in verse 6, how the captain of the ship wakes him out of slumber. And then we find in verse 7, the casting of lots. And we discovered in weeks gone by how God is sovereign over all and even in control of the tiniest and most minute of details. Even in the casting of a lots, God was in complete control of. And then last week, we looked at verses 8 to 12, and we saw the prophet on trial. And we had two points, the interrogation and the intimidation. And under the interrogation, we looked at those seven questions that were asked of Jonah and the various answers that he gave and the various questions he avoided to answer at all as well. And then we found in the verse 10, there is no doubt about it, that Jonah was guilty. And obviously he's admitted to his guilt already because the men knew that he'd fled from the presence of the Lord and uh, because he had told them. And they'd asked him what they should do um, that the sea may be calm for us. And Jonah, um, even though he didn't know what really what was going to happen, but because he was a prophet, even at that time in his backslidden state, the Lord spoke to him and he said, pick me up and throw me into sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. And tonight we're focusing our thoughts on these verses 12 to 16 under this title, Man Overboard. Because we find a very extraordinary thing here. You see, you've got to remember that as we read the book of Jonah, we are at an advantage. And it's often said, isn't it, that hindsight is a wonderful thing because we know the story. We know what's going on. We've been taught the account of Jonah from our earliest years in Sunday school. And we have the luxury of being able to read through all of the four chapters. And yet, um, you know, at the same time, but friends, just put yourselves in the shoes of Jonah. Put yourselves in the shoes of those sailors for a moment and just consider where we are in this account. Because Jonah is guilty. Jonah tells them that the only way out of this is to cast me overboard. Now, remember, Jonah doesn't know yet that a whale has been prepared. The mariners don't yet know that the storm is going to really become calm. They don't have a clue what the future holds. But you see, we have that luxury tonight, but they did not. And we find their fear and their trepidation on all accounts as we find man overboard. It's very interesting that Jonah walked on board this ship and Jonah had every intention of walking off that boat in Tarshish. I am sure that neither Jonah nor the mariners didn't have a clue that halfway through the journey, Jonah would have to be thrown overboard. But not only thrown overboard, but thrown overboard by his own orders as well, because it's Jonah that told the mariners to throw him overboard. 
But I want to say this before we get into these verses and into the thrust of our study tonight. There is a prevailing theme on our subject this evening, and it's this, that disobedience never ends well. In Genesis chapter 3, of course, we have the first recorded incident of disobedience, and you know how the devil came to Eve and tempted her, and as Adam stood beside her, listening to all of this, and as her husband should have stepped in and said, get thee behind me, Satan, but he didn't, and he listened for the temptation, and we read that the Lord had to um, say to the serpent, uh, sorry, uh, because you have done this, you are more cursed than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and eat the dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and his seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. But because of their sin, God said to Eve, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And he said to Adam, because you've heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now, you know, friends, we need to realize in our lives that the devil very often quotes God. And, you know, when the devil started to tempt um, Eve, it's quite interesting because it says in verse 1 of that chapter, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the fields that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And, you know, it's quite interesting because he was implying, wait a minute, Eve, aren't you hard done by God not allowing to eat of all the trees? You're limited. You're restricted. That's not what God has said. As God said it, and, you know, he comes, the devil, with his spin and misquotes the Lord. And it says, the woman said to the serpent, when we, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, the Lord didn't say that either, because in chapter 2, verse 17, God said, but of the tree of knowledge and good of evil, you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. God actually never mentioned touching the tree, but uh, he mentioned eating of it, and then they would surely die. But at least Eve wasn't going to even touch it, but Eve knew exactly what was expected of her, and yet when she saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she then took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. But, you know, disobedience didn't end well because the Lord said, I will multiply your sorrow and your conception in pain. You will bring forth children and so on. He cursed the ground, didn't he, as we've already read for man's sake, and thorns and thistles, and 
eat of the herb of the field in the sweat of your face till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken for dust you are and to dust you shall return and you know friends we find all these consequences and actually you know friends it's very important and um, there are numerous scriptures in scripture about disobedience not ending well but I particularly want to turn your attention to the first book of Samuel and chapter 15. The first book of Samuel and to chapter 15. Because we find a principle here from the mouth of the prophet Samuel. And we find that Saul is told very clearly and very explicitly in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 2, thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Al Amalek for what Amalek, sorry, for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed them on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. But what does Saul do? Look at verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lamb, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. You know, friends, Saul, so, it's, sorry, I want you to realize that Saul did the opposite to what God had said. God said they all had to be destroyed. But you know, he, he thought he knew better and decided to save certain of the the sheep and so on when god had said not to do it and that disobedience didn't end well and as we've noted from jonah and we've noted from adam and eve it's the same thing disobedience never ends well in fact in once in one samuel 15 samuel said in verse 22 of that chapter has the lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed that, that than the fat of rams. But listen what he said after that. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. My word, that's strong in it. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. And he said to Saul, he has also rejected you from being king. Your own friends, those were powerful, powerful words that were said to him. The kingdom of God, sorry, the kingdom of the land was ripped from him and the Lord no longer acknowledged him as being king and the Lord rejected Saul as being king. But I've turned you there for a purpose because in that 22nd verse, we find a principle and it's a principle not only for Solomon, uh, for 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 Saul, it's a principle not only for Adam and Eve, it's a principle for Jonah, it's a principle for you and I that we need to adhere to, that to obey is better than sacrifice. And you know, friends, it simply means this, that if Adam and Eve had just obeyed, there'd have been no need for the cross. There'd have been no need for the Father to be pleased to bruise him if we had just 
obeyed. And how often we are not obedient to the Lord and to do his will and to do his way and to put his word into practice in our lives. And you see, Jonah, who boarded the ship in Joppa, heading for Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord, well, his disobedience didn't end well, because it says in verse 15 of Jonah 1, so they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. My word. Disobedience never ends well. And so many times, you know, friends, those little acts of rebellion, we're shaking our fist against almighty God. But be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, the Bible says, that shall he also reap. But as we come back to Jonah chapter 1, verses 12 to 16, I want you to notice three points with me. I'm not going to be over long tonight, I hope. But three points. The sentiments, number two, the submission, and number three, the service. So you can listen out for those points. So first of all, then, the sentiments. Now, there are some sentiments here in our passage, both from Jonah and from the mariners. Jonah said in verse 12, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Now, Jonah has said, pick me up and throw me into the sea. He was advocating the death sentence. You see, Jonah doesn't know that there's a great fish in the plan of God waiting to swallow him up and take him back to dry land eventually. But in Jonah's mind, he knew that for his sin, he should be cast overboard. And that as far as Jonah knew at that time, would have been the end of his life. He was going to die. And that's what he must have thought in that moment of time. Put yourself in Jonah's shoes when he said, pick me up and throw me into the sea. You see, he was advocating the old biblical death sentence of capital punishment. And we find that the mariners didn't really want to do that. They, I don't know whether they disagreed with the death sentence or whether they were just trying to be kind. But it says, nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land. But of course, they could not. But you know, friends, it's very interesting. Because remember, Jonah had been a man of God and he knew what God's law was. Because way back in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, God said this, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God... He made man. So, you know, God, in the, way back in the Old Testament at the beginning, advocated when a life needed to be taken. You know, it was not just an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It was a life for a life. You know, throughout the Old Testament, there was no none of this locking somebody up for 20 or 30 years for a life sentence, and then having more problems when they get out. You were put to death in those days. 
And whilst I, I don't want to be controversial, but let me just leave a thought with you, and I'm not asking you to agree uh, with me on this, but could it be that if our society will be better off if those that have caused terror and anarchy in shedding much blood would have been dealt with as God dealt with them in capital punishment rather than letting language in, in prison and then causing endless problems for governments afterwards in the nation. Because certainly God said, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. And then in Exodus chapter 21, and in verse 12, this is what we read there. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. That's God's law. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. Now, as I say, we're looking at the sentiments here in Jonah chapter 1. And we find that these sentiments from Jonah, when he said, throw, pick me up and throw me into the sea, you know, he knew what God's law was. And those sentiments were not popular in Jonah's day, just like they're not popular today, because even the mariners didn't want to do it, because it said, nevertheless, <laughs> they rode hard to try and get to the land but they could not. You know, folks, we live in a very liberal society today. We live in a society where if you stand up and quote the word of God, it isn't popular. It isn't desired. It isn't wanted. You're classed as a bigot or old-fashioned. But friends, we know as the people of God that the God says the wages of sin is death. We know the Lord Jesus had to die to satisfy the justice of God and the, the wrath of God over sin, to pay the price of sin. And it was a scriptural principle. But these mariners, I know it might sound nice that they wanted to help Jonah. It said they did their best. They were trying to row back to the harbour. You know, Many people in our world today think that they can earn deliverance and salvation by rowing hard, as it were. They discount the word of God, but they think by rowing hard and doing their best, you know, it will bring them to the harbor. But you know, the Bible says it's by grace that you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Well, you know, friends, what about us believers? Because, you know, sometimes, and it's just a thought that occurred to me today. Sometimes, as believers, we can roll hard, as it were, but we can roll hard sometimes against the will of God. You see, for instance, it was clear very clear that Jonah knew what the will of God was. Pick me up, throw me into sea. The sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. We know what the will of God was because when they picked up Jonah in verse 15 and threw him into the sea, the sea ceased its raging. So we know what the will of God was. But you see, the mariners had a nevertheless in verse 13. Look at it, nevertheless. So in spite of the will of God, nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to the land. Now, don't get me wrong, I suppose in their eyes, they were trying to save themselves and save Jonah, but it was against the will of God. 
And you know, folks, I once preached on, I remember preaching a long time ago on a particular text in scripture, the will of the Lord be done. And you know, friends, when we read in scripture that we are to put our lives on the altar for God and to give our all to God, it means living in the will of God. And yet, how many times do we row in the opposite direction? But you know, our lives are to be acceptable to God. Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And you know, friends, our lives, when we work for God, when we live for God, they've got to be lives that are acceptable to God. And they're acceptable to God when we work within the will of God. These sailors rode hard to bring the boat to the land. But you know, friends, it says there in Jonah chapter one, but they could not. They could not because they were just full of sentiment, you see. They were pulling in the wrong direction. But secondly, tonight, look at the submission. Verse 15. They finally submitted to the God's will, and it says they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from raging. So it took them a while, but eventually they got there, and now we're reading about a man overboard. It's interesting that in this submission that we find in verse 16, there is really a picture of salvation because we see faith in the submission you see these mariners were not yet saved the tempest is raging the bible's already told us the ship was likely to be broken up they're still very fearful and yet the very fact in verse 15 that they actually picked up jonah and cast him into the sea shows that they must have had faith in the word that was preached to them in verse 12 when Jonah said, pick me up, into the, throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you. They must have believed it. They must have finally showed faith in what Jonah's prophecy was because remember, it was prophecy of Jonah that the sea will become calm. But here they acted for it. And, you know, we need to do things in faith. This was a picture of salvation because so often people hear the gospel. and uh, But, you know, friends, they can hear the gospel and hear the gospel and hear the gospel. But you know as well as I, it's not enough for their souls until they actually perform the action of faith in Christ to repent and to believe the gospel. You see, there has to be an action in view. And these mariners must have had complete faith by this time in what they'd heard from Jonah when he said, pick me up, throw me into the sea, and the sea will become calm for you, and showed faith in what he'd said. But not only do we find faith in this submission, we find praying because it says in verse 14, therefore they cried out to the Lord. Now, before they'd all prayed to their own gods, but here they cried out to the Lord. And we said, we pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. And here we find these men, they were concerned over this act of capital punishment and throwing Jonah overboard. That's why they said, do not charge us with innocent blood. We don't want this man's blood on our account. But their faith came because they prayed. And because they prayed, their faith in the word came and then they submitted to the will of God and they were able to act on what the word was. 
And you know that crying out to the Lord indicates a fervency, a desire, an urgency, a compulsion on their souls. Oh, friends, when were we really last as fervent in prayer as these men were on that occasion? You know, it says in James chapter 5 and in verse um, 4, 16, it says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And that's what we're reading of when we come to Jonah 1 verse 14, when it says they cried out to the Lord. And they said, we pray, O Lord, do not let us perish for this man's life. Do not charge us with innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it please you. And we find a complete submission because they actually acknowledge for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. In other words, they were saying, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, the sailors began the journey rowing hard against God. But now in their urgency, there's an obedience to the word. There's a submission. And they did what pleased the Lord. May we get to that point where we say, Lord, thy will be done. But look at this uh, verse 15 again, because we not only find this submission, not only in faith, and then in praying from verse 14, but we find peace in the submission because it says at the end of verse 15, and the sea ceased from its raging. So, friends, I want to say, you know, it's a wonderful thing because the peace arrived when they submitted to the will of God when they obeyed the word of God and prayed to the throne of God, that's when peace arrived. David Livingstone, it was, he said, I would rather be in the heart of Africa in the will of God than on the throne of England out of God's will. There's always peace comes, you see. You know, we can go through the hardest storms in our lives, and Christians are not immune from storms and difficulties and sicknesses and all sorts of terrible things. But you know, friend, even in the storms, we can find the peace of God that passes all understanding. So I want you to not only notice the sentiments and the submission, but thirdly, the service because we read of an impromptu church service, if you like, after that. Look at verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Friends, that was a worship service like no other service. Because when those men left the harbor, in verse 5, it says, the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God. These men were pagans, absolute pagans. They didn't know have an almighty God or have any time for an almighty God. They were heathen. No time for Jehovah. But yet, in verse 10, we know after hearing what God had done and hearing of the storm and hearing it was the hand of God, and hearing that Jonah ran in the opposite direction, it says they were exceedingly afraid. And yet when the storm had ceased, you know, one would have thought, well, why can't they relax now? It's all over the storms, the sea's gone peaceful. But it says in verse 16, the men feared the Lord exceedingly. They were more afraid, even though the sea was calm but it says they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. You know, friends, when the storm had ceased, they came to the Lord. You know, there were three elements. Have you noticed in verse 16 in that worship service? First, the motivation. 
they feared the Lord. <laughs> they feared. They feared the Lord exceedingly. And then the verification for worship. They offered a sacrifice. In other words, you know, the sacrifice of blood. And of course, we worship Christ on the merits of Christ's blood. And then the consecration of their worship. They took vows. Now, you know, friends, we need to remember every time we come before God in worship, we're coming to Almighty God. And that is so important, friends. We're coming before a holy and an almighty God. And the book of Proverbs, chapter 9 and verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. When we come to God's house, friends, we should come in reverence and in fear of the Lord. You see, and then they could only worship on the merits of sacrifice. Now, can you imagine? Think about that. Because they hadn't much left on ship. Remember, in the storm, they'd thrown the cargo overboard <laughs> to lighten the load. So, you know, friends, they must have actually been using what was most precious to them for that sacrifice, their essentials, what they had left on the ship for their survival. But you see, they counted their saving more oh. than their well-being because there wasn't surplus on the ship, yet they were able to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. You know, friends, the Bible tells us we can only be saved through a sacrifice and that was the shedding of the blood of our lord jesus christ hebrews 9 22 according to the law almost all things are purified with blood but without the shedding of blood there is no remission calvary would have been in view at their sacrifice you know friends they made their vows then to the lord now i know in matthew chapter 5 we're cautioned about making vows. We're warned about making loose promises and oaths that we cannot keep. But nonetheless, in Scripture, we are commended for doing things that help us in our godliness. Now, those men made vows. And in James chapter 1, and... In verse 22 of James chapter 1, it says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Now, these men came into contact with God through the storm, through the word from Jonah, and then faith and prayer and action, and then the storm was calm. I wonder whether Jonah told them the gospel just before he threw them overboard, because otherwise they wouldn't have known that they needed to make a sacrifice. Have you thought about that? But they did, and they made vows. They determined in their lives to consecrate themselves to the Lord, all that we would have the same desires. It says in the Psalm uh, 76 and in verse 11 of that Psalm, it says, make vows to the Lord your God and pay them. Let all who are around him bring presents to, all, to, to him who ought to be feared. That word presents can be translated offering, sacrifice, fearing the Lord coming on the basis of shed blood and leaving the worship service afterwards, determined to live for God uh, with all our hearts and all our lives. You know, friends, mariner, man overboard, mariners saved. One last verse, and that's in Psalm 119. Psalm 119 and verse 71. 
David could say, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn from your statutes. It's good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn from your statutes. Well, I'm sure the mariners could say that, because they'd certainly been afflicted, that they might learn from the statutes. You know, friends, I trust that God will help us and bless his word to our hearts tonight. And we learn those lessons from the man overboard. Well, we'll tell you more about what happened to Jonah next week. Okay. Father, bless your word to our hearts. Help us now as we come to our time of prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen.